Anton, are you ready? Yeah. <coughs> so, hello everyone. Uh, Terraform, Pulumi, AWS, uh, SDK. Uh, you probably have heard about this many things, and you probably want to see why we have all of this. I have five minutes to explain you my point of view. It's going to be a little bit tough. Uh, I'm extremely opinionated because I'm active contributor to several Terraform <laughs> projects, and uh, I like what I'm doing and I can actually protect what I'm saying. So uh, if you disagree, please do tweet or follow or whatever. Uh, oh no, that's old slides, actually. Because uh, in this time there shouldn't be any disclaimer. Uh, okay, anyway, uh, this is a previous generation of slides. So disclaimer, I already told, I'm a big Terraform fanatic. Uh, okay, so there are uh, 101 shades of infrastructure uh, we all know that uh, PowerPoint became obsolete uh, since it's saved on your disk. And uh, we have a different variation of like JSON, YAML, or configuration file, where we're actually coming from. Historically, we had uh, all of these uh, CSOPs and developers, that's why we're here, config management. So that's all what we had before. And then we add WordCamp, now we are at config management camp. I thought that's the reason. Uh, and uh, also, yeah, it's funny that there's old generation of slides, but uh, uh, Puppet, Chef, and Ansible, we all know, uh, they were created for a different reason, uh, not for infrastructure management as such, but they do a pretty decent job still. And uh, what we have right now is different flavors of uh, AWS uh, provided tools um, and uh, community-driven tools like Terraform, and of course, Pulumi, because we cannot mention Pulumi. I mean, we cannot skip Pulumi. Even John mentioned Pulumi a couple of times. So uh, CloudFormation started 2011 because uh, uh, AWS wanted us to manage resources and do this as possible, uh, as best as possible. Though serverless application model appeared because it was not so easy. And CDK is something of what was inspired uh, by people who use CloudFormation at least two days. Because first day you are happy, second day you are looking on GitHub for alternative template generation tool. And that's why CDK started. Back in 2014, uh, several people started, okay, let's do something totally, totally good, totally awesome. We don't take any legacy, no affiliation with public cloud provider, and we have our HCL language, which is not like uh, uh, JSON or YAML, and it's really easy to work with. Cool. Once you start using uh, uh, Terraform, you will soon understand that, oh, it's actually getting harder and harder, and you have to copy-paste a lot of code, modules, and so on, so TerraGrant. TerraGrant is orchestration in Terraform. And uh, Pulumi said that, okay, we're actually going to satisfy developers' ego since 2018, and here we are. Uh, we give you all general programming languages, Please use uh, what we have uh, historically created, uh, Terraform, and uh, here you are. So now what we have is that uh, we have to think about uh, what users actually care about. Think about declarative or imperative, push, pull, and a bunch of other things which we've been thinking like, yeah, that's cool because it's less lines of code, or I can use cool programming language. No, actually, uh, object-oriented uh, is better than DSL, and a bunch of different things like that. Then you can say like, oh yeah, but this is a very popular tool, so I'm going to stick to that one. Come on, simplicity, velocity, and maintainability, that's a key thing which we are uh, going to have in some time. Uh, we saw this uh, drunken circle, uh, at least during a couple of presentations, and simplicity, to my understanding, is often the reason for reinventing the wheel, because we want to have. If you are into uh, EU kind of things and you want to help Develop this one, uh, there is a project or product, or I don't know how it's even called. Anyway, somebody wanted to uh, use 16 million euros. Um, yeah, and uh, I think we are actually going in the right direction. And what I mean in the right direction, we have a lot of tools already, and we will need a lot of opinionated stuff on top of that which means that Terraform gives you a lot of stuff, but not enough opinionated. So we need to have well-architected architected best practices, um, like Pulumi uh, Crosswalk, for example. And uh, I'm looking forward for the day when Terragrant features become merged into Terraform, because that's what people actually ask. 
And all, uh, I honestly believe that we are uh, kind of in an urge situation where we have to write for humans. Uh, that's why I published terraformbestpractices.com because I want to explain, in my opinion, what does for humans mean. And always keep it simple uh, as, as you're writing it for your uh, seven years kid. Thank you. Who wants next? John, Felix? Felix is coming. So, Felix, are you ready? Yeah. Yeah, so now for something completely different. Hi, I'm Felix. I like using Ansible for certain things. Uh, recently, I've been busy deploying using Ansible operating systems to a significant number of servers, both hardware and virtual. Uh, you might think, hey, I know Felix, he's a nice enough guy, why would he do such a thing? Well, it's because this elephant has been a big part of my life. Um, I will be running through a lot of code in a minute, um, really running. So uh, let's first talk about the stack uh, at, all, at large uh, for a minute, because only then will it make sense. Uh, the customer is a SUSE licensee, so we are deploying mainly SUSE Enterprise, and it kind of makes sense to uh, go for SUSE Manager, which is a, a fork of Red Hat Satellite, to uh, manage repositories and stuff. Uh, the SUSE Manager gives us Cobbler, which is nice for uh, provisioning of operating system. Uh, we have HPE for hardware, we use the integrated lights out management, VMware's for virtualization, and there's one more tool I'll be mentioning in a minute, and the final platform uh, includes FreeEPA for DNS and LDAP. There's uh, Kerberos from Corporate AD, uh, Corporate being the customer. And uh, SUSE Manager also comes with SALT, so we use that for config management. But let's talk a minute about IP address management, which in this brave new cloud world, uh, many of you may have forgotten about, but if you run these middling scale data centers in a corporate context and uh, you only get to work with limited address ranges, it becomes an actual thing. So we installed a tool called the Neat IP Address. Uh, Neat IP Address. Oh my god. I'm losing my train of thought completely, but it's a, it's a cool tool. Um, I can recommend it. Uh, it gives us the ability to have this web UI and an API, and uh, we have this hierarchy of subnets, and it can allocate and deallocate addresses in there. We can add automation, and we don't lose our minds, which is a nice benefit. So whenever Ansible is asked to uh, create a new server with an operating system, it will allocate an address if needed in this uh, neat, address, uh, neat IP address planner. That's it. Sorry, and uh, get all the information like uh, VLAN, subnet, info, etc. It can then register it in the free EPA, we get DNS and all. And uh, then on Cobbler, it generates the boot medium to run the OS installation, boots the machine, in case of virtual machines, it creates the virtual machine. And the machine then finally uh, joins the salt. So, source code. Um, when Ansible is supposed to talk to the IP address planner, uh, well, Easiest way was to just run it on the NIP app server and uh, use the CLI and, well, one year later, still the same, surprise, surprise. I'm not even ashamed. Um, same thing happens with uh, the generation of the boot media. For example, if we want to install SUSE, uh, we just have Ansible go to the uh, cobbler server and run make SUSE CD. And we throw the IP address data from the NIP app in there, which is kind of nice. For virtual machines, uh, we went for a tool called GoVC. Uh, it's a Golang implementation, and we found it to be somewhat more featureful than what the Ansible built-in VMware support offered us at the time. Uh, that, was, that was a pretty good decision, I feel. Uh, worked well. As for hardware, um, the trick is to uh, add the integrated lights out management interface to the Ansible inventory. We can just do that because there's a uh, host name pattern where we can derive the name for the, for the ILO from the name of the machine we're deploying. And then we use Ansible's raw module as well as a tool called ILO REST to do BIOS configuration, uh, powering off the machine, creating rates, all that fun stuff. Uh, registering to salt is just done via script. 
uh, the, the OS we deploy comes with a post boot script that in turn downloads what's called a bootstrap script from the SUSE manager and salt minion is started, calls up to salt. And the SUSE manager, which is uh, also kind of nice, gives us this little web UI in which we can uh, accept and decline incoming salt keys, uh, have control of what's going on. You can use the normal salt command line as well. It's, it's all very uh, modular, but um, works, works well with the web UI as well. And in order to um, have this running smoothly on several locations around the globe, uh, we just need to uh, add some location-specific variables to Ansible. For example, what's the local name server or what's the credentials for the vCenter here? And yeah, uh, putting all this together, when we want to deploy a machine, we just have to specify its name, what type of hardware it is, which operating system and the subnet. And for the virtual machines, uh, some sizing information. And that's it. Uh, yeah, I, I hope this was somewhat inspirational. Don't know if, it able, if anyone can reproduce it uh, based on that particular stack, but yeah. Catch me if you the track. It's me again. Um, hey, for a completely change of direction, my family vacation last summer. So I took my family. So I, get, I travel so much, I got a gazillion points. So I, every year I go with Delta and Marriott, we get to do cool things. So we went to Japan with the family. And uh, we got a rail pass. And uh, so we actually went down to Hiroshima. We went to Kyoto. It was pretty cool. We, we got to sort of get, it was about 12 days um, the, you know, not counting the travel time, so. Um, and here's the thing, that guy, my kids are spoiled, like, I'm sorry, I had him at an old age. That guy next to me, the only reason we went to Japan was Kobe beef. And uh, I felt so guilty about the amount of money we spent on this. I spent like $200 to Planned Parenthood. Um, but here's the thing, my family didn't know that I was gonna make them go to the plants. Cause I'm a lean person, right? So we, they were really, they're like, they're pissed. Like they may be smiling, but they're really upset that I made them go to the, the Mazda plant, right? So, okay, yeah, right? So like, okay, dad. But like for me, like this is like vacation, right? There's the Andon cord. There's the sort of rotating thing. Um, you know, just, just the, you know, like I, I've spent a lot of time trying to try thinking about sort of lean manufacturing to what we do in DevOps. So, and here's the thing about Mazda that was interesting, I didn't know this, is that the CEO of that, that company was going to get a haircut about 100 yards from the epicenter of the um, explosion. And he missed his appointment, went to the factory. The factory was sort of built a hill, and he survived. So there really is this interesting way when you think about their culture in this company of that it's like the kind of what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. It's, it's you know, they invented the rotary engine, but just sitting and sort of not only seeing this sort of lean tech, but seeing that, and then I stole another day. Again, Furious Family, I had to go to the Toyota plant, right? Like this is, this is the, like my, my home, you know? But, and they didn't make it easy. You had to walk through bushes and shit to get to it, right? So, um, you know, I had, I, and there's my kids, like, like freaking fucking furious at this point, like, right? <laughs> Come on, kids, we gotta take a picture. You know, God damn you, Dad. All right, so, and again, it was really hard to get over to the original office space, but, uh, but what was cool, though, is, well, so this was their original car. It was like, well, we were doing Model T, they were doing this uh, Model AA, right? So it was their thing. And, you know, there's a lot of sort of, like, cool history, um, but th what was really cool is when you start your tour there, it's like sort of a Disneyland of lean, <laughs> you know, continuous integration, right? Continuous improvement, like for kids, you know, like, you know, very sort of Disney-like. And so you're, as a student, you're thinking about all the things you, like I've done in my presentations about lean and the Toyota house, and you're seeing these things like show up in lot of, sort of cartoons of, you know, Jadoka and Just In Time, and they're explaining it. Um, you know, like again, if you've sort of geeked out on lean, this is sort of crazy to see the cartoon version of it for every mom and pop. But here's what I really got cool. The Toyota continually innovates. I call this factory as code, right? So they, they, they don't let you take pictures in the plant, right? But so they, they refabricated the line to be completely unbundled. 
Like, this is pretty innovative, right? Like, you can basically put the line anywhere now. You can sort of shrink it, expand it, you can put it in a new fab. That, all that classic fabrication is gone. Like, so, because everything's wireless now. Like, even the andon cord's wireless. The where, where you do, like, how you get your parts. So, like, this is a good example of they can shrink or, or expand the line depending on capacity because it's not bound by all the framing anymore. It's literally, they realized in a wireless world, you just need a long track that you can basically get everything in place. It's, it's pretty brilliant. Um, and then we walked past this room and it was the dojo. And they wouldn't let me go in, you know. Please, let me go into the dojo room to see what a real dojo looks like. But there's a big picture of like how they do the Toyota dojo. Like if you've been following the whole DevOps dojo. And then, then we did, uh, so I stole two and a half days of a you know, 10, 12 day vacation. But there was an automobile museum as well, which had pretty much every freaking car that was ever made, not just Toyota. So it was pretty insane. Like you literally, um, you know, like the deuce of and like these just like ridiculous. It's probably the, the, the most interesting single car museum that, you know, that has to be anywhere in the world. But here's the thing, right? Like I'm a good dad. Like we only spent two and a half days at these plants. Like we did cool stuff. Had anybody been to the robot uh, restaurant? That freaking place is insane. It's like dolls with robots and lasers. I mean, I'm not saying I ever did acid, but man, I'm telling you, it's like you're doing acid in this place. It's freaking crazy. And then we end up at Toyota Disney, like, I'm a good dad. I only stole two days. We had a good time. So there you go. Thank you. More holiday pictures. <laughs> hey there, it's not going to be as much fun, sorry. Uh, you already saw me from yesterday. Today I'm going to talk about Terraboard. I think quite a few of us, uh, of you also, uh, use Terraform, and there's been quite a lot about Terraform. And this is a project that uh, uses Terraform and extends it. Actually, I copied that slide from the previous one. I didn't uh, notice. So it says I'm an OGS and OGS provider developer, and obviously this has nothing to do with Terraform. So I also contribute to to Terraform in the form of the Rancher, Papa TA, Papa DB pass providers. So when you want to do collaboration in Terraform, uh, the first thing you do obviously is share your code in Git, use PRs, you know, stuff like this. But then it comes to a point when you need to share states because Terraform stores states. Uh, using uh, Git to store it is a bad idea. So what Terraform does is that it provides remote states using different kinds of backends. So there's S3, console, SD, HTTP, and so on. And the, the list goes on because you can expand it. Um, so these remote states allow to share information between your team members so that they can get the state back. And these remote states are pushed by Terraform after the plan is applied. Uh, and they're essentially JSON documents that are stored in different places and different backends. They can be versioned if the remote supports it. For example, if you use S3, you can uh, uh, version your bucket, and then you get versions of your state. So the remote states essentially contain metadata, like the date and stuff like this, the resources that were applied, the modules that were used in your Terraform code, the parameters and attributes for each resource, so lots of information, and the outputs as well, in more recent versions. So we thought, hey, you know, this, often this question, you know, where is my resource managed? I, I have this resource and I don't remember where in all my Terraform projects I actually manage this, this stuff. And all this information is there in this uh, states that are somewhere on an S3 bucket. So uh, the idea was to create a web interface called Terraboard, which will get this information from S3, get all these JSONs, put them in the database, and provide a web interface uh, that will allow to uh, visualize and query this, uh, this information. So currently it supports S3 and Terraform Enterprise thanks to a PR from last uh, month. So the main view actually lists the different projects you have with the different resources and the amount of resources uh, over time uh, and with, with the version of Terraform you're using and some statistics on top because that's not fun when your boss comes. Um, then there's a state view when you click on one state and you can see all the information, the resources with the details, the properties, the attributes that we used and so on. And you can actually uh, go a little bit further and you see on the, on the top left, 
you can actually compare versions. So you can put an older uh, version and it will just do a diff between uh, the two JSON files if you have a, a version um, state, like in a, in a version bucket. And you will see the differences that happen between the two dates. So you can find when the parameters were changed and which other parameters changed. And then there's a search view. Because we have everything in the database, we can do search. And this is why it's useful. So you can just search by resource type, resource ID, by attribute value, and so on, and find in which projects and which values uh, these this different uh, parameters uh, happen. So installing is pretty straightforward. Um, you can just install it with GoGet, for example, because it's a Go project. Um, you can use Docker image as well, which is ready-made. And we've been deploying in production originally with Rancher and more recently on OpenShift with Helm. So both uh, options are there. Uh, it provides a RESTful API because it's essentially a Go uh, backend with AngularJS on top, so you can access the REST API directly. It's not very well documented, to be honest, but you can always automate stuff with it. And so that allows to get the information directly as JSON. So here are a few use cases of, of Terraboard that we've actually used. Finding a project by IP, I've got this machine with this IP, I have no idea where it was declared. You can just put the IP in the search view with the attribute value and it will tell me where this IP ha happens and in which resources. Uh, another case, which told, didn't happen to me two weeks ago, is rotating AWS keys because it was necessary. So find all the AWS keys in the account uh, using, using Terraboard and find in which projects they were declared so that we can taint the resources and force them to be renewed. Another case still, uh, when did a parameter change? So you can go into project, do a diff between the states uh, and see when that parameter changed and which other parameter changed at the same time, which allows to debug actually when something happened, which is a bit hard with Terraform sometimes. Uh, last year we started a, a project called ChairDB and the idea was to get the, the database itself and the API out of Terraboard and leave Terraboard just as the front end. And the idea also is that you could provide a remote backend HTTP uh, with this API. So you could push directly from Terraform instead of using an S3 bucket and then synchronize to a PostgreSQL DB. So in the future plans, we have plans to actually bring that back into Terraboard so you can stop synchronizing between an S3 bucket and Terraboard, but instead just push using HTTP and other stuff. So uh, come see me if you have uh, questions about this. And I still have a few stickers from yesterday, actually. <laughs> That's yours, right? Okay, last one for today. So, hi, I'm Jan. Um, recently somebody asked me if it's still advisable to use Docker. Um, so he was referring to this trouble around the company. And he asked me if he could switch to this cryo thing he heard of. So I'm a consultant, I answered, well, that depends. <laughs> and I said something about configuring the cluster. And he said, no, no, stop, wait. I'm just building images. So that's basically the group I want to address here. Um, if you want to build images, you can use Cryo. It doesn't bring a tool set, and that's the point where this talk could end. But we want to go a bit deeper. Um, because he insisted that there is something like this um, common line tool, Podman, here. Um, well, yes and no. Um, so Cryo is just a daemon which runs in the Kubernetes cluster, and the Kubernetes cluster can talk to Cryo, use it as its backend container runtime, through the container runtime interface, that's the cry in the name. And Podman is not a common line interface to Cryo. Um, it's a separate tool, but like built with the same mindset, but they use a different library. So with Podman, you cannot see the containers running in Cryo. I think that's like one of the main things you should take home. However, there's large overlap between the contributors to the two projects, and eventually maybe this will really merge. So this, um, my conversational partner then understood that he should not switch to Cryo, but to Podman. Um, and he asked, how can you do this? Well, it's quite simple. It's the, really the main message, just install it on your machine and say Elias Docker equals Podman, and you can start right away. Which means um, you do not have to learn 
a large new set of commands. You can just start with the things you know from Docker, but eventually there is more. Like It's not only Portman, there are separate projects which are also um, using the same ideas. I want to specifically mention Builder, which is basically meant for building images. Um, however, if you do this switching, you will lose something like Docker Compose. There is no replacement. It's also not planned to have something like Docker Compose in the Portman universe, let's say. It's more planned towards the world of Kubernetes. For example, you can use pod definitions like in Kubernetes, which you can directly run from Portman or also generate out of Portman. So this um, guy then asked me if I'm still using Docker. Um, yes, I am. Uh, mainly because of this um, Docker Compose. Um, and in the clusters, it's a bit more complex in Kubernetes clusters. But on my laptop, I'm mainly using Docker to build images. And there are some issues, probably heard about that. Um, mainly, there is this very privileged um, central daemon, um, which basically is not really needed if you just want to build images. So if you ever had a look at a Docker image, it's just a tarball with the layers of your image and some instructions how to create a container. The format is standardized by the Open Container Initiative. This is the O in Cryo. Um, and it's the same for all different runtimes, like Portman, Cryo, and Docker. They all understand the same kinds of images. Which also means that you can, for example, use the same registries that you all used before. Um, you can also go like back and forth, switch at some point to Podman, have a cluster running Cryo, um, then again use Docker, um, all thanks to the standardization both of the image format and how these runtimes really create the containers out of it. And you can also use hybrid approach, and I want to quickly sketch my hybrid approach in CI pipelines, build pipelines, so we at Atix, we are using GitLab. And if you don't know, GitLab has an integrated container registry, so every project can have uh, its repository and also namespace on its registry. And then for the pipelines, you have separate instances called the runners. And in our case, um, there's a Docker running which starts a container. Inside the container, you can pull the code and then do something and maybe eventually push something to your registry. And now the trick is, I build an image using Builder. Um, Docker then now is, is running this Builder made image to do all these CI tasks. Um, and inside this image, so we have a little code also here in the next slide. Um, it's a, based on a Ubuntu something, and I install all these tools Portman, Scopio, Builder. And if I use this as a basis for my um, CI task, uh, I have all these tools available in my pipeline. And, and then the pipeline is quite simple here. So GitLab pipelines, you define the, the base image and then the script. You, you see here I use this image I call Portman and I have all the builder tools available to push them to my registry. And this is like the hybrid point I'm at at the moment. So maybe it goes further. Thanks.